Hi everyone, um, thanks for attending my talk for NahamCon, um, putting your mind to it, bug bounties for 12 months with me, Z Shorno. I'm very honoured to be able to speak at this conference and I'm also honoured to be able to sponsor it as bugbountyhunter.com. Um, if you haven't heard of it, definitely check us out at bugbountyhunter.com. So, what is my talk going to be about? Well, I'm a strong believer that if you put your mind to something, amazing things can happen. So, this talk will be aimed at experienced and in inexperienced people because I'm basically going to set you a task at the end of this for the next 12 months for you to go at and hopefully you'll find some cool bugs and earn some bounties potentially. Because um, I'm hopefully going to ease some of your concerns and show you that with time, effort and patience, the sky really is the limit, um, especially with bug bounties because you can sit at the comfort of your own home and hack on so many massive companies with so much in scope. And it honestly will keep you busy for a long time. So for those of you who do not know who I am, my name is Z Shorno. Uh, my real name is Sean. I'm a self-taught developer, web application hacker and mentor. Um, I first started out developing websites, age 11, 12, 13, etc. Um, and eventually learned how to hack and yeah. Um, now I do mentoring um, on bugbountyhunter.com, which I mentioned earlier. But the site is aimed at teaching people how to identify vulnerabilities and web applications, but also applying this knowledge on bug bounty programs. So in the membership section, once users find enough bugs on the vulnerable web application that I set up, they can join what is called hack events. And I will basically hold their hand and show them how to apply my methodology and identify vulnerabilities on public bug, uh, bug bounty programs. Um, I'm a big fan of just targeting one program and literally just going as deep as possible, finding out what, what works, how it works, etc. And I actually managed to achieve rank 2 on Bug Crowd when I first started out in Bug Bounties. Um, I targeted literally one program. It took me eight, nine months, literally just focusing, understanding how things work. And yeah, my profile is now deleted on Bug Crowd, but we won't get into that. So, Bug Bounties for 12 months. Think about it. And I will get into that bug bounties isn't all plain sailing. It's not all, I mean, fun and games, amazing. There are some whole loop, not loophole, sorry. There are some like holes as such and concerns and problems, but we'll get into this. So for the moment though, just sit back and think about this, right? Companies around the globe will invite hackers like me and you to legally poke at their systems. Legally, you cannot get in trouble. They have, most of them have safe harbors and they will say, hey, you can hack and if you find anything, tell us and we'll pay you. Literally, you sit at the comfort of your own home, hacking at your own pace, and you can get paid big money for it. So as a hacker, Bug Bounties has enabled the internet to become your oyster. So literally, as it says there, let's hack the planet. <laughs> so my first tip for people wanting to succeed in bug bounties. Now, like I say, this is aimed at experienced and inexperienced people. Um, if you don't understand like too much about web application hacking and vulnerabilities, then of course, this talk might not be um, of as used to just at the moment. Go away and learn from, um, how to find web application vulnerabilities, practice against some challenges, um, and things like that, and understand what XSS is, cross site request forgery, open URL, read, open URL redirects, IDORs, and things like that, because you need to understand the common vulnerabilities and what they are, why they actually exist. So, for example, with XSS, you chuck it some input and it reflects it back as HTML, you have your XSS. Whereas with IDOR, you're looking for integer values or some sort of identifier in the request, um, and if you change it to something else, you're able to either view or modify or do something to someone else's data, right? So, a lot of people will think, or they're told, sorry, or they're advised, look for just one bug type. Learn all about XSS and just go look for XSS. I don't believe, in my opinion, that's a good approach because you're going to miss so many bugs and how thing, features and things like that. So understanding how it works and then you know what to look for. So example, a login flow. When you're logging into a website or you're registering, look for OAuth, SSO login tokens and things like that. Look for, look for what happens. But not only that, once you're signed in, let's say, for example, you signed into google.com, go find a subdomain that you can sign in 
and see when you press sign in well first of all are you already signed in if you're not if is there a sign in button that when you press sign in maybe it doesn't re-ask you for your username and password and there's some sort of token exchange happen and it just logs you in based on this a token. Do you know what I mean? That token identifies who you are. That's for user experience. They don't want you to have to re-log into every single website owned by Google. They want you to be able to visit their website and you're in your account. You're, if you're logged into Google, you want to be able to log in all their services, right? That's then when you can use a harmless open URL redirect um, to potentially leak that, for example. Editing your profile. Why would you think to look for an idol and edit your profile? Well, think, go look at editing your profile on some websites. You'll see your account ID sent in the request. Maybe it's sent in the URL. Maybe it's sent as some post data. Potentially, it's actually sent as a header um, if it's a mobile app sometimes. And believe it or not, there was a bug disclosed on a heavily tested website on Yahoo, believe it or not, where they, it was naffy, where they found an idol simply via the cookie value. I mean, it's on one of their slides from years and years ago. Cross site request forgery. It's an easy account takeover. And not only that, but I always recommend people go test features that should be the most secure. So updating your account information on, for example, Google should be secure, right? There should be cross site request forgery token. They shouldn't be allowing anyone to update anyone's information when they visit the, tag, uh, the um, attacker's website and things like that. So see how it, how does it work? What How are they validating and that where the request came from and things like that? And stored XSS, because I mentioned earlier, any time you can input information and it's reflected back, you want to be testing for XSS and server-side template injection and things like that. Anytime it's reflected back, you chuck that at it and see what happens. Developer tools. Now, go onto Google right now during this talk and type in Hacker One um, Webhook SSRF. You'll find some disclosed reports, you'll find some blog posts and things like that. Now, again, understand the features and what to look for. So when you visit, for example, developer.paypal.com and you can see that you can test instant payment notifications and webhooks, you then have to think from a hacker perspective and add in a bit of a developer thought, right, okay, so we've got a feature here that is intended to send a request to the website that I input um, and it's going to query it and pull the metadata and display it to me. So you then as a hacker need to think, well, okay, well, what's this developer done to stop me from querying for um, internal services, some metadata things, and et cetera, do you know what I mean? And then down the rabbit hole you go. Maybe they've just simply blacklisted saying, no, you're not allowed to look for local host. If local host is inputted here, block it. But maybe some different encoding will bypass it. Maybe it literally is just a hard-coded, do you know what I mean, string to look for, um, redirects and things like that. And that's because these developer tools, which are made for developers, for, do you know what I mean, for users to use, they're purposely coded with like the intention of like it's, it's a server side request because they're sending the intention of that feature is to send a request to this website, pull the information, but then you add the hacker mindset and you start poking around. Um, and the same with mobile apps. Go check and see updating your information. Like literally, run burp now on your phone. Open a few apps that you've got installed. Obviously, you have the HTTPS cert installed, etc. SSL pin in, and just update your information. You'll see your ID may, like used in a lot of apps to identify which account to update. Now, with that in mind, most features on websites work the same. They take user input, they handle it, like they do something with it, and then they maybe reflect it. Now. That's why you'll look at some hunters and say, how can you just find so many bugs on this website? It's quite tough. And that's because with years of experience and something that hopefully you, over the next 12 months you're going to pick up, you'll discover that, like I say, websites work the same. And you'll be able to look at a website and you just know. You just see a, see a certain request. You see a certain parameter. You see something certain reflected, etc. And you just know because... Pretty much things work the same. Obviously, I mean, there's a variety of how requests are sent, JSON requests, etc. But again, that then opens up even more things to test for because if every single request is sending JSON data, we'll change the content type to um, application XML and see if they're passing XML because maybe they are and you can get XXE. Whereas if you didn't see that, you potentially wouldn't think to try that, would you? Do you know what I mean? If it was just sending it as a normal post, um, I just need a drink. So, yeah, hopefully people understand that. So it's not a case of, right, I'm just going to look for XSS all over Google. It's a case of, right, I'm going to understand what this feature is in front of me. What can I do with it? Um, 
But yeah. Second tip. Don't spray and pray. Find the right way. Now, I'm not a fan of just spraying payloads everywhere and hoping for the best, using the same payloads. I'm not even a fan, really, of polygots because when well, you're chucking quite a lot at it and a certain part of that payload might trigger some sort of waff or filter and then it all might not go through and, yeah. So, like, this is actually a bug on Parker, believe it or not, and if you visit bugbountyhunter.com, there is actually a tutorial, um, like my flow of looking for XSS on there, and it says there, start harmless first. Now, like I say, this bug is on Barker, where if you chuck script alert, it doesn't work. Whereas, if you give it a H2 or some harmless HTML, you'll see it's reflected. So then... Then you start going down the rabbit hole and, okay, well, how can I make this malicious? What is actually going on? And down the rabbit hole with testing you go. But you've started harmless first. You've started off with something that's probably more than likely going to reflect back to you. And you can confirm, is this vulnerable to XSS? What are they actually reflecting? And very easily, you can quickly test for XSS on the fly. Um, an example of this is a heavily tested website. I was literally just given it. Image source equals X on error alert. Didn't work anywhere. Um, and then I was trying to bypass a, a random filter on there, like with XSS, where it was reflected, and I needed a single apostrophe. Um, and then I, re I when I tried it, it, I saw that it actually reflected my HTML, like it's valid HTML, and I was like, huh? So I went and revisited a bunch of XSS and discovered that any time I added a single apostrophe to any of the XSS payloads, it worked. Um, this is what I can assume is some anti-SQL injection code run on their website or whatever. But yeah, that was a, a weird bypass in my opinion. So, but don't just chuck the script alert. Chuck various payloads at it. Chuck various characters at it. See how things are being handled and what is being reflected. And then you can work your way from there. The same applies for everything, in my opinion. Um, so with SQL injection, don't just chuck it a random, like a, a payload that you found on the internet to get the database table versions or anything like that, because they might be filtering this, WAF, etc. Chuck just like a single apostrophe or some random characters that are going to break the SQL. If it's vulnerable to SQL injection, if you're giving it a single apostrophe and some other random characters, like read up on SQL injection um, with what you can test it with, if you can get it to give you the error, then you can work your way from there. With XXA, for example, don't just go ahead and try read some internal files. Try just a basic doc type replace. See if it's actually going to execute that. See what isn't working, what is. Um, and it says there, start harmless and then go malicious. Now, by malicious, I don't mean become a criminal and exploit their system and be a bad person. No. What this means is, and I'll give you an example. So if you watched my stream with Ben, uh, Ben stream, sorry, and I joined the stream, and chat picked a target, and they picked Rockstar Games. Now, starting harmless means you give the website what they're expecting to make the feature work. So in this case, there was a return URL on Rockstar Games. Um, so we give it Rockstar Games. That's a harmless payload. They're expecting that. That's what they want. But then we want to start making it malicious. Okay, let's work out what they're looking for here. So if I tried Sean.RockstarGames, do they still trust it? Okay, and you work your way through there. Have, have they got the trailing slash, for example? Because if not, I could try RockstarGames.Computer. Um, what about local relative redirect? So just forward slash test. Do they, in, do they automatically input for me the RockstarGames.com forward slash test? Or does it just redirect to forward slash test and they're trusting the browser to handle all of that for me? Is there some sort of logic going on there where they're forcing it to be Rockstar Games? How does it handle different characters? So you're starting off harmless and you're working your way to malicious. And then you're being the best person in the world by reporting it and hopefully getting a bounty if you find a bug. <laughs> so... Understanding your features and then understanding the payloads that you're chucking at it and what's working, what's reflecting and how it's handling it. Because sometimes some bugs are vulnerable to more than one thing. You might find stored XSS or some XSS, but maybe it's also vulnerable to SQL injection. You don't know, do you know what I mean? You test some things, see how things work. Now, this is some, is some advice. Now... This isn't a tip as such, it's just advice. 
finding a program to hack on. So we've learned to not spray and pray. We've learned to work out how features work, etc., etc. Now, finding a, ho a program to hack on. This is something a lot of people struggle with. Um, newcomers, they join. Um, they're recommended to I mean, find some flags or be active, etc. And prove you can hack and you'll receive some invites. Most people tell me that the invites they receive aren't that good they're not that interesting they're not that active like etc and yeah that's fair play and that's why with bug bounties ultimately you can take the success into your own hands now there is no special source and there is no way for me to tell you go hack here you'll find bugs because a program that i might succeed in you might not succeed in. you might find frustrating you hate it and you're like how does sean find bugs here it's about what works for you? What do you enjoy on? Um, if you can enjoy hacking on the site that you're hacking on, you're going to have so much more of a good time because when you're digging deeper and finding things, you get that hacker dopamine rush. You get that the, the, the tingling senses see, feeling. Do you know what I mean? Anyway, it's like, oh, what's going on here? I want to find out. And then when you actually get the bug, it's like, whoa. You feel proud of it. Do you know what I mean? Whereas I have looked at some targets where it's like, really don't I'm not, you just don't enjoy the site like there's not a lot to play with there's not a lot to do as such um that's not necessarily saying you should walk away from that program because there might be some bugs but enjoying the site you're hacking on will help you be a lot more successful in my opinion because you're going to enjoy it aren't you now i've also put there do not rely on bug bounty platforms to send you invites in order for you to be successful at bug bounty um at bug bounties because in my opinion that's step one to burnout now what you define as success is up to you. Um, I know there's probably some people at Bug Bounty Platform shaking their head at that right now, uh, but this is coming from somebody that's had years of experience with Bug Bounty Platforms and hacking, and I've heard from lots of people and things like that. Again, what you define as successful is up to you. That might be one bug a month. That might be just your first ever bug. That might just be your first ever critical bug. That might be you quitting your full-time job to become a full-time bug bounty hunter. The reason I say don't rely on bug bounty platforms to send you invites is because, well, you take, you, you, you're putting your success kind of in someone else's hand and let's say to them like, well, hey, come on, send me some invites, do whatever. Whereas you'll discover majority of companies welcome hackers. Um, and you shouldn't rely on invites. It's just, I could sit here for ages talking about this, but it's probably for another video. But yeah, that's not to say, by the way, I'll just go back on that. You should 100% join every single bug bounty platform. Do you know what I mean? Join every single one, definitely. And if they send you invites, check it out and whatever. But don't rely on them. That's, that's what I'm trying to get across. Don't think, oh, I'm going to join a bug bounty platform, get really high up in the rankings, prove whatever, and hope they send me invites. Because potentially, yeah, might work in some people's cases, but ultimately, no. And yeah, it's a lot better to kind of take the success in your own hands. I mean, I will explain a little bit more of that in a bit. Now, when you're picking a program, and I am going to give you some help, and like I say, I'm going to give you some homework at the end of this, believe it or not, to get you going. So, and you're not going to have to get invited to nothing for this, don't worry. <laughs> so, you aim to at least, to spend at least six months poking at your target. Bigger the scope, the better. Um, because bigger the scope, and think about different teams, different code bases. Perhaps a different um, language site, like, for example, I know a bug bounty program where their .com and their .cn are completely different code bases, different teams, whatever. Um, there you go. So the bugs you're finding on .com, there's going to be completely different things on .cn. And I wonder how many people actually go visit other different websites. Um, I'm thinking not many, if I'm honest. Um, the reason I say bigger the scope, the better, because, well, personally for me, I like to really dig deep into a program, lots to play with, and the bigger the scope and the more to play with, the more mistakes. The more mistakes, more bounties come in your way. <laughs> now, if you're not prepared to put the time in, in my opinion, don't be expect to find much. Don't expect to find much, sorry. Um, or if you are just going to put, like, let's say, just whatever, not a lot of time, run some tools, then you're probably just going to find some dupes. Now, I'm not saying you need to sit there and put, tw I mean, a full eight-hour day learning to hack or hacking or whatever. But don't 
just look at a target and skip through it so quickly. Actually feel confident that the site is secure. Feel confident that you could, at the end of this test that you were giving them, say, you should be proud of the, how secure your website is. Um, and this is where your notes will come into play because you'll be writing lots of notes as you're going along. Um, but yeah. So, like I say, while everyone's waiting for private invites, Naffy just goes and hacks on Google for a couple of months, right? And fair play, he has so much experience with hacking. But there's nothing, nothing stopping any of you viewers right now watching this to learn Google for the next 12 months and crush it. You don't need to prove that you can hack to anyone. You don't need to hack for free on VDPs to get private invites and all this and that. This, in my opinion, is what a bug bounty program and vulnerability disclosure program is. It's a company who believes they have their defences in place and they are saying to the world, hey, if you can find ways around our defences, we will pay you for vulnerabilities. They've not had to make you jump through hoops because that's, in my opinion, not what a bug bounty program and crowdsource security is. It's not really crowdsource security if it's cherry-picked security, is it, in my opinion? So... And that's why I say, take the success into your own hand because look, there's nothing stopping any of you from looking on Google and other bug bounty programs, Facebook, Apple, etc. So, third tip, sharing is caring and how you can create a lead for yourself. I actually give this as a training session for um, bug bounty hunting members. Um, we dissected some um, write-ups and we went against the program and had some fun. Now, I'm a big believer in sharing is caring. I try share. I've shared lots of writes up over the years, uh, tutorials and things. Now, one big problem I ran into is companies don't want me to disclose bugs. No, 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 Sean. Sign an NDA. Or if I ask to disclose a bug, they don't tell me no. Instead, they ban me. Um, so, in all honesty, I give up asking to disclose my, my research and my findings because it's just a ball ache right now. So this is why it was massive motivation for me actually making Barker and Bug Bounty Hunter because no one can stop me from recreating the bugs I found and making a web application full of these actual bugs. Do you know what I mean? Um, so that is a big part of actually Bug Barker and Bug Bounty Hunter and the challenges and fast food hacking. It's all the bugs I found just recreated for you to find because, well, I can't get in trouble for that, can I? Because I haven't named names and I haven't disclosed stuff and you can then also get the benefit of learning how to find it yourself by understanding how the web application works. Um, so with that said though, lots of people share lots of epic write-ups. And these write-ups, not all write-ups have good information because some write-ups are just a basic summary and don't have a lot. But some write-ups are gold, so much information, and they can help you find bugs. So just digest the slow issues and you can create a lead and like a starting point for yourself. You literally can go test the disclosed bugs and place yourself in the same place as the other hacker. Find that request that they've talked about or potentially they haven't spoke about but they've spoke about a certain feature. Go find that request. Go find how it's been fixed because potentially you might find a way around it. You might find a bypass. Every hacker approaches things differently. Um, or it might lead on to more bugs. Potentially this hacker, because it happens, you, it happens. You get a hacker dopamine rush. You find a bug, you're so excited, maybe you've been looking at it for two hours, you feel complete, so you submit it, and then you go away. Potentially there are similar bugs related to what's been disclosed. More than likely, yes, because developers reuse code, um, and depending on what the bug is, maybe it's a site-wide issue. Um, I'll give you an example. Sam Curry and everyone else who contributes to that, their post on Apple is gold. There are so many key areas in that post, right? If you seriously read his post in detail and understand where they looked for those bugs, right? Follow their footsteps. Literally, go follow their footsteps. You, you will see... Yeah, like I says there, I'll let you work it out. I'm not gonna... Yeah, go have a look at Sam's post read what they did, follow their footsteps, log the request, you'll be going down the rabbit hole. And again, you don't need an invite to this program. There is so much. And yeah, I personally know that people are killing it on Apple. <laughs> so, like I say, digesting the information, read it, finding the parameters that were used, endpoints used, the bug type, where it was found, etc., etc. 
Um, so, with that said, everyone, your target for the next 12 months is going to be Google VRP. And so, if you all want to check out David Who's um, ex David Who's post um, on GitHub, there, huge shout out to him for contributing this and creating this. Um, and I want everyone to tweet over me over the next 12 months and let me know how you're getting on. I'm going to run through what your tasks are. Do not worry. <laughs> um, so before I go through those, I just want to real quickly just run through very, very quickly. First tip, understand the features and what you're looking for. So logins, updating your information and what other features they offer you. Developer tools, mobile apps, etc. Second tip, don't just spray and pray. Understand what it is you are testing and what you expect it to be vulnerable to. Try various payloads. Try harmless payloads that they're expecting and work your way to malicious and how you can create impact. Second of all, yes, sign up to every bug bounty program uh, platform out there, sorry, but don't rely on them to send you invites in order to be successful. Um, and again, what's well, successful is up to you. And... If you're watching this thinking, well, I'm probably not going to have a lot of time to get into bug bounties and you're not actually up for spending the good six, 12 months at this, then it, this probably isn't for you. Um, then, yeah, there's nothing earning money. And lastly, the last tip, like I say, creating the lead, which is what we're going to go through now with your task, everyone. So if everyone is ready, let's do this. So if you can see here, I literally opened this GitHub didn't open any posts, just had a little look at what they were called. And this, the iDoor one, I, I know iDoors, in my opinion, are just as common as XSS. So I clicked onto it, I uh, read through it, and I've highlighted here, in my opinion, what I think is interesting. Guessing the idea here is not possible, but if the victim shared his file, the ID will be visible in the path. He got $5,000, um, and it was vulnerable to iDoor. So it'd say to me, any other time you see a similar ID like this, you should try for IDOR because maybe the developers had the same four. No one, they, like maybe Google developers or whoever coded this as such didn't think this, but potentially they thought, no one's probably going to try another value here because they're not going to be able to work out how to get this. And do you know what I mean? Um, how do we also know if you try just an integer value there? What about if you try the value just one or 100 or whatever? Maybe it'll respond. Um, you never know. So that was literally from me. That that's me just looking at that post instantly. And I'd be I'd go test that now in Data Studio. And I'd also consider: Is there any of that same code in Data Studio? Potentially, other people have found this because it was a 2019 post, admittedly. But potentially, throughout J Data Studio, there were similar bugs. The code was reused. Do I like to say developers reuse code? Trend is your friend. Yeah. So everyone. Your task. First of all, digest all Google VRP write-ups that you can find. Whether that's on GitHub, whether there's just other blog posts, whether you um, know some friends. Obviously, you shouldn't just, don't just um, share private information as such, but do you know I mean if they can give you some hints or anything like that? But yeah. So write endpoints, directories, and parameters used. So where was this bug found? So let's say, for example, it was example.google.com forward slash friend service forward slash whatever, whatever. Go Google Doc for the friend service. Maybe that leads on to more API calls and things like that. Same with the parameters. Are these parameters used everywhere, anywhere else? What's going on? Um, what was the bug found? Was it a simple idle? in front of literally everyone? Did the XSS require a special bypass? Um, was it a, a really cool chain where they needed to use an open redirect with a server-side request forgery to get this and pull this, do that? What was required here? And then not only that, but think about how has the developer fixed it? Because not only when you're going to go test it, but how have they fixed it? So obviously with XSS, you can fix them relatively easy. But if it's a complicated bug where you're sending some sort of server-side request forgery, uh, server-side request, uh, but that's what the feature is intended to do, how did the developer stop it from being malicious and broken? What did they do? And where was it found, basically? Um, so, and like I said, I put there to so test various ways to buy, test various ways to um, to bypass it. And there's actually um, a bypass I actually found there on a heavily tested website recently, where they wanted it to end in .jpg or .png. And if I put .html .hashtag .jpg, it accepted it and it actually saved it as just file .html. 
And again, write lots and lots of notes, trust me, because you, when you look through Google, you're going to find things that look so similar and you're going to be able to, like I say, pick up the trend as your friend and be able to know, I know what this is used for, I know where this is, blah, blah, blah. And you'll pick it up, trust me, you need to trust the process. <laughs> and that's why hopefully a lot of you are going to follow these tasks that I've set. So second task, everyone. Now, so you're digesting all this information as to where these bugs were found. XSS, idols, what was going on. Now, your task is to continue hunting for the next 12 months, but not just go relying on recon. No, and just don't go just run your recon scanners and, oh, I've got a lot of subdomains and I'm just going to do this. Um, rather, we're going to be focused on web apps. Ones that you can interact with, log in, upload stuff, post stuff and things like that. You want things that there's lots to play with because there's lots of new code shipped regularly. Because even though there's posts um, were disclosed a while ago and they might be fixed, how do you know your old code wasn't reintroduced? So find, yes, you've got to do recon on Google because there's lots out there, do you know what I mean? And there's not just one single hub point you log into Google. Do you know what I mean? The main idea of Google is a search engine, but they've got Google Mail, Google Ads, etc., etc. So find all Google subdomains and domains because I believe, without looking, um, a lot of stuff of Google is in scope. I'll have to check this, but check their policy of what's in scope. But find all Google subdomains, that, everything that's in scope that you can log in and interact with. Because that's the thing, you want to understand how these things work and break these features. Um, and not only that, but when you're doing your recon, you'll make sense of what the recon means. Um, you'll understand what this subdomain does, what you can do with it. So make sure you can edit your profile, post some content, upload some stuff, uh, etc. But check, is the login flow e the same each time? Every single time you're logging into this subdomain, so mail.google.com, ads.google.com, etc., is it the same? Is it the same on mobile device? Is it the same on Android and iPhone? You can actually get um, uh, iPhone and Android user agent in your browser from an extension on either Firefox or Google uh, Chrome. Um, so you don't actually need the device to test it. How, how does each thing work? Do they all work the same? Um, and another common thing is Google don't really care because it's actually in their policy. They don't care about open redirects, right? So with that in mind, you're going to probably find a lot of them out there. So what can they be used for? Leaking tokens, service request forgery, and things like that. Um, so, yeah. But not only that, but test and understand how each feature works. So, and this goes back to not just trying one bug type everywhere. So, for example, on Google Ads, you can invite other users. So, let's say, for example, you invited another user. Can you set permission and roles to this user? And are these permissions and roles working correctly? Do they work correctly? Is there a Google Ads mobile app? Has It might not be vulnerable on the, on the desktop version. What about the mobile app? What about if it's a completely different team? What about if they outsourced it a while ago to get something developed just to get it off the ground and they've never really got it changed? You don't know. Go test and see how it's working. And again, this is why it can take a long time to really dive deep into programs and web applications and understand how they work. But honestly, if you follow the advice from here for the next 12 months, please do keep me, if you do um, try this out, please do keep me updated with how you're getting on. And I'd love to know because I'm honestly going to do it as well with you. Um, just not... <sighs> Probably as lot, not as like I say, not as long, but probably not as much as you lot because I don't have the time really. Um, but yeah, so it may be daunting at first, everyone. What do all these parameters do? What does this mean? What what happens if you're completely brand new and you don't understand anything about hacking? One hundred percent, you need to go away and under like learn le learn hacking basically. Check out Pen Tester Lab, Bug Bounty Hunter, the Hacker One Hundred One, and things like that, and understand learn check out videos on youtube tutorials and understand what hacking is etc um but understand once you've been looking on google and you understand what the parameters do and things like that then it will kind of over time make sense to you um we've all been there i've been there all the top hackers have been there think about it it's fresh to you you're attacking it blindly aren't you um but like I say, the more you focus on the target, everyone, the more you understand, I've seen this parameter being used, I've seen this, I know this is the cross-site request forgery token, the more you test it and the more you click around and use and make sure to write notes, 
the more you will begin to see, the more you'll be able again to say, oh, well, I actually can do this and this happens. Um, rather, like I say, rather than just focus on one bug type. I believe in you all, though. Trust me, there are bugs out there. Like I say, I've hacked with uh, members on Bug Bounty Hunter of hack events on a public program which people thought, I mean, I'm not going to find anything on here. And I literally showed them how step by step we digest information and what to do with this and dorking and leading on to things. And they're all now finding bugs by themselves on this program without me. You can do the same. You just got to put the time and the effort and actually want it and actually be like, okay, I want to make a complete mind map of how everything on Google works. What ones can I log in? What functionality do they have? Have any old bugs been found in these subdomains? And you'll get it. Good luck, everyone, and happy hacking. I hope you've enjoyed my talk. I hope I haven't rambled and bored you all. Um, and I wish you all the best of luck for the next 12 months. And please do keep me updated. Um, and I hope you will find some bounties, because trust me, they are out there.